first speaker will be Andres Sembinas, who will be telling us about joint work, also with Kaspars Balotis, Alexander Balavs, Troy Lee, Juris Smotrovs, and Miklos Santa. And the title is Separations in Query Complexity Based on Pointer Functions. <laughs> you should try now. Okay, is it working now? Yeah. Good. <laughs> so, I'm finally ready to begin the talk. Uh, the topic of my talk is comparing different models of computation, classical versus quantum. And classical might come into several varieties. We can think of deterministic computation where the next step of the computer is uniquely determined by the previous step. So that would be mechanical computing machine following instructions. Or we can think of probabilistic computer which flips a coin and chooses the next step probabilistically. Both of those are classical, but these are different models of classical computation. And we can think of quantum computing, which works as quantum states and performs instructions on them. And I'll be comparing these three mod models of computation in the model of query algorithms. So in the model of query algorithms, we typically have some function of some unknown input data. We access the input data by queries. We can ask what is the value of the ice input variable, and we get the value. And we measure the complexity by the number of queries to the input that it makes. And this model captures many quantum algorithms, most famously Grower Search, but also many others. And it is very convenient for comparing models of computation, because if we think of general model of computation like Turing machines, we don't really know that factoring is hard. And we might say that factoring is easy for quantum computers and hard for classical computers, but we don't really know. We are just guessing that there is no classical algorithm for factoring. In contrast, if we deal with query algorithms, we can prove lower bounds. We can say this problem takes so many queries quantumly, and we can prove that it it is not solvable with the same number of queries classically. And a deterministic query algorithm is just a decision tree. It starts by asking value of some variable. And then the, based on value of this variable, it makes a decision. It either goes one way or another way. Then it decides on some other variable that it might ask gets an answer, 
Depending on that, it might either output the value of computation or it might ask some other variable, and so on. And complexity is measured by the number of queries. On every input, there is some number of queries that the algorithm makes. In this example, this number is two for some inputs, three for some other inputs. And the complexity of the whole computation is measured by the worst input. We take the worst input, we take the number of queries that the algorithm makes, that's the complexity of the algorithm. If we think of probabilistic computation, we essentially have a probabilistic algorithm is essentially a procedure which chooses one of several decision trees and then makes the queries according to it. And on every input, we have the expected number of queries that the algorithm makes. And then the complexity of the algorithm is against the worst case number of queries for the worst input. But now it's the expected number of queries for the worst possible input. And quantumly, we have quantum interference. Different paths of computation might interfere. So we can no longer describe a query algorithm by a tree. Rather, what we have is a quantum state. On this quantum state, we perform queries. A query flips the phase of a quantum state depending on the val value of a variable. And we can interleave these queries with arbitrary transformations that are independent of the input. And we assume that the transformations that are independent of the input are free of charge. The only thing that we are charged are queries. We want to compute by making as few queries as possible. So we have three models of computation, deterministic, probabilistic, and quantum. And actually, probabilistic and quantum computation comes into several varieties. We can think of probabilistic algorithms that always output the correct answer. They are known as zero error algorithms. We can, make, we can think of probabilistic algorithms that only make error in one direction. So if such probabilistic algorithm tells you that the value of function is one, you can trust that it's correct. If it tells you that the value of function is zero, most likely the answer is correct, but there is some small probability of error. Or we can think of probabilistic algorithms with two-sided error. These algorithms can make error in either direction. They could output one instead of zero, or they could output zero instead of one. They are typically called bounded error algorithms. And similarly for quantum, we can think of exact quantum algorithms which always output the correct answer, or we can think of bounded error algorithms which could make an error in either direction. And for them, we require that on every input, the algorithm outputs the correct answer with certain probability, say at least two thirds. And the big question in this area is how do all of those com quantities compare? And most importantly, the most general model of error is bounded error model. So how do bounded error quantum algorithms compare with bounded error classical algorithms? And how do both of them compare with deterministic algorithms? And one can actually construct very big gaps between those measures of computation if one considers partial functions. So here is an example of that. This is a variant of deutsch josse problem which was one of the first problems for which quantum algorithms were, quantum algorithm was invented back in 1991. So we have the following task. Our algorithm must reject the input if all input variables are zero, and it must accept it if half of input variables are zero and half are one. And if neither of those two is the case, the algorithm is allowed to out output any answer. There is a very simple quantum algorithm that makes just one query and always distinguishes between those two cases. And there is also a probabilistic algorithm that distinguishes between those cases with some probability of error and just one query. So this algorithm is query one variable. 
if that variable is one, tell us that it's the second case. If that va variable is zero, flip a coin, and depending on the answer of coin flip, either tell us that it's, that, that, uh, it's the first case or it's the second case. Yes? <coughs> and in, in contrast, if we had a deterministic classical algorithm whose uh, query locations are determined in, in advance, it could happen that this algorithm keeps getting zeros. And it gets, and it, in that case, the only, the, the only point at which algorithm knows the result is if it has queried more than half of the variables. If it has only queried half of the variables, it could be the case that all variables are zero, or it could be the case that this algorithm has unluckily queried zeros in an input where half of variables are one. So the only point at which this algorithm could correctly tell, tell us that all variables are zero is after it has queried more than half of the variables. So we have a separation between quantum and randomized complexity of one query and deterministic complexity of n over two plus one query, which is huge. <laughs> And also, one can build almost as huge separations between quantum and randomized. Tomorrow, I'll be talking about an example of a computational problem, which is solvable by just one quantum query, but requires square root of n queries for randomized uh, algorithms, where n is the size of the input. And in both of those cases, the computational problems what we consider are partial functions. There is some set of inputs on which function is zero. We must output answer zero. There is some set of inputs on which function is one. We must output one. There is a huge set of inputs on which the computational problem is not defined, and the algorithm is allowed to output anything. Now, if we consider partial functions, it's easy to build huge gaps between different models of computation. All that we have to do is we have to take an algorithm in one model of computation, select the inputs on which it does well, and then define the function so that it's not defined on any input on which this algorithm doesn't do well. Now, if we want to consider computational problems which are defined for all inputs, it becomes much more difficult to find big gaps between quantum or quantum and randomized computation, or quantum and deterministic, or so on. So here is what was known up to this work. For quantum versus deterministic, the, best, the biggest gap was Grover's search. If we consider Grover's search on n elements, deterministically we need n queries. Quantumly we can do with square root of n. For randomized versus deterministic, uh, the biggest gap that is known uh, is randomized complexity of n to power 0 0.75 versus deterministic n. n minus 1, okay. That's <laughs> well, if you define it as a decision problem of deciding whether there is one. Okay, and both of those results have been around for quite a while. Grover's algorithm is known since 1996, yet there is no example with a bigger gap. And this classical result about randomized versus deterministic was known since 1986 with no improvements. I will now show what this classical example is. The problem is this. We have a tree consisting of AND and OR gates. It's a binary tree. Every vertex of the tree has two children. And at every vertex of the tree, we evaluate either AND or OR of its inputs. And then for deterministic algorithms, they need to query all variables to know the answer, because they could end up querying variables unluckily and querying the variables which decide the, the, the value of the tree last. And if we have a probabilistic algorithm, it could choose probabilistically which branch of the tree it computes first. And then there is a 
probability of essentially one half of choosing the, bran uh, the branch which decides the value of the tree. And as a result, probabilistic algorithms do better, and there is some computation involved in computing how many queries exactly they need. The result is that it's of the order size of the tree to power 0 0.7537. So these were the best results up to now. We improve both of them. We give an example where deterministic complexity is n. Uh, well, uh, randomized complexity is order square root of that. And quantum is order fourth root of deterministic. <laughs> and for simplicity, when I say order square root of n, what I actually mean is order square root of n times some log factors. Uh, so big O here really means big O with tilde on it, but in PowerPoint I cannot put tildes <laughs> nicely enough. <laughs> so the same disclaimer applies to all, all, my, all the other of my bounds that I show. So now two things to note. I'm presenting a force power gap between the power of quantum <coughs> computation and the power of deterministic computation. Now, the gap between quantum and probabilistic is still quadratic. All the quantum computation that is going on here is just Grower's search. So what happens is that I'm combining Grower's search with a quadratic gap between randomized and deterministic to get a force power gap between quantum and deterministic. And the second thing to note is that a few months after this work appeared, uh, Scott Aronson, Shalev Ben David, and Robin Kotari also gave a better gap between quantum and randomized. They have an example where quantum complexity is randomized complexity to power two fifths. And that will be presented in a plenary talk at the same time tomorrow. And you, and you can't combine it with Grover to get fifth, fifth root Unfortunately not. <laughs> and there are a few more results that I have. So the technique that we use is actually very powerful, and it can be adjusted to give better separations between various query complexity measures. Uh, so we can also uh, use it to give better results for exact quantum algorithms. So exact quantum algorithms are quantum algorithms that always output the correct answer. Uh, if we think of total functions, there are very few of those known. Three years ago at Stock 2013, I gave an, exa an example of exact quantum algorithm for which the number of queries is the classical number of queries to power 0 0.8675. And that was the first example where exact quantum algorithms have an advantage that is more than factor of two. So now we give a quadratic advantage for exact algorithms over deterministic algorithms, which is also a quadratic advantage for exact quantum algorithms over classical algor over randomized algorithms that make no error. And we also give an advantage for exact quantum algorithms over probabilistic algorithms with error, which is power of two thirds, n to two thirds for exact quantum algorithms and for probabilistic algorithms with error. And there is one more result that we have, that, which is classical, but, but which we consider very interesting. So the result is that we give an example where the randomized complexity with error is quadratically smaller than the randomized complexity without error. And this is the first gap between probabilistic complexity with error and probabilistic complexity no error, with no error. OK, and all of this is actually based on a method invented by someone else. So the basic method was invented by someone else. We tweaked it to give all of those bounds. And the three people who invented this method are Goose, Pitassi, and Watson from University of Toronto. And 
a few, a few months before our work, they had this paper, deterministic communication versus partition number. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we did. <laughs> so in this problem, they solved the communication complexity problem called clique versus independent set. And I will not go into what it is, because it doesn't really matter for this talk. But they had to invent a function with the following properties. This function is hard to compute deterministically. And at the same time, if the value of this function is 1, we can certify that it's 1 by giving uh, values for a small number of variables. And moreover, this small subset of vari variables that certifies that function is 1 is unique. There is one set that certifies that, and there is no other set that certifies that, except for sets that include this one set. So here is how it works. So this is not the function yet. This is something towards this function. We consider a, an n by m table. And we consider a function that is 1 if this table has a unique column in which all variables is one, are 1. Now, this function is hard to compute for deterministic algorithms because a deterministic algorithm might choose to query the relevant variables last. Uh, on the other hand, if we wanted to certify that this function is 1, we just have to give var variables in this column that consists of 1s, and we have to give 1, 0 for, e for every other column. So here is an example of a function that is hard to compute deterministically, because the algorithm might be unlucky and might choose the wrong variables to query, but it's easy to certify for someone who knows the input. Now, the issue is that those certificates are not unique. A column might contain multiple zeros. And if there are two zeros here, we could put either one of them uh, in a certificate. So we, we must find some way of making it unambiguous. And the way to make it unambiguous is to specify which zero in each column goes into the certificate. And here is how Goose, Pitassi, and Watson did that. In addition to zeros and ones, they introduced variables for each cell pointing to another cell. And they, they define a function as one if there is a column with all ones. In this column, there is a unique uh, cell that points to another cell. And if you start at this cell and follow the pointers, you end up following a chain of pointers which contains exactly one zero in each column. <laughs> now, this is still hard for deterministic algorithms because they could query the relevant variables last. On the other hand, if you give someone the location of this all one column, he can find the pointer in this column and follow the chain of pointers and check that all the relevant properties are satisfied. Yes, so this function is hard to compute deterministically, and it has unambiguous short certificates that certify that it's one. How can you check if it's not another? There, Well, we are requiring that this column of ones has exactly one non-trivial pointer. So you allow you allow pointer. We allow trivial pointers, yes. <laughs> OK, so here are a few pictures. So <laughs> we like this function because it has two properties. First, it's very elusive to compute. No matter what deterministic algorithm there is, we can twist the input so that the deterministic algorithm queries the relevant variables last. And on the other hand, if one knows the right starting point, it becomes easy. 
And to illustrate that, I have a picture from Greek methodology. So this is Ariadne giving Theseus her thread so that he wouldn't get lost in the labyrinth. So in our case, the thread is this column of ones. Once we have that, we can traverse this uh, rectangle of zeros and ones and check that the function is one. OK, so this was Goose Pitassi Watson function. So now what we do, it, do, we twist it to obtain more results out of it. 